Good afternoon and welcome to the Severfield PLC investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted any time by the Q&A tab. Sit you in the right corner of your screen, just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it received in the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Alan Dunsmore, CEO. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon and uh, welcome everybody to our inaugural Investor Meet presentation. Uh, I'm Alan Dunsmore, Chief Executive of Serrafield, and I am accompanied by Adam Semple, our Chief Financial Officer. Um, first of all, I, 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 by way of background, Serrafield PLC is the, the UK's largest structural steel company. We design, fabricate and direct structural steel for a wide range of construction projects and you'll see some examples of the sectors that we deal in as we move through move through the presentation. So I'd like to start with the, the five pillars of our investment case. It starts with the exciting growth prospect. We've, we've, we've aligned the business with sectors with strong growth potential in both the UK and Europe. Uh, we're well positioned to win projects supporting the low carbon economy. Um, and we have a, an Indian joint venture, which we believe is well placed to grow significantly and build a lot, a lot of value in, in India over the next um, next few years. We've got a resilient business through the economic cycle. Um, we've got a good sector, geographical and client diversity uh, and good earnings visibility from a strong order book. Uh, and we've demonstrated th this resilience over the past, the past few years. The whole business is built on a platform of operational excellence. Uh, we continually invest in our uh, production footprint, our processes, systems, technologies and so on. And during the, the past, past financial year, we've launched our group-wide digitization project, which we're calling Project Horizon. The business model generates strong returns. The cash generation is good. Uh, and we now have an average five-year average return on capital employed, exceeding 15%. And Adam will say a bit more about the, uh, the cash model a little bit later on. And finally, um, we have a strong focus on sustainability uh, and that's becoming more common for many businesses now um, but it's been part of our dna for quite some time and we'll see more about that as well so five key pillars of the investment case and as we, as we go through the slides you'll see uh, supporting evidence for all of these all of these points so moving on to the headlines of the, the results it was a good set of results for the uh, the last financial year revenue up 22 percent 492 million pounds underlying profit before tax up 20% to £32.5 million, which was slightly ahead of expectations due to some strong operational delivery on some key some key projects. Our cash flow for the year was strong, we improved working capital and we finished with net funds of £2.7 million. What's important for us though is maintaining the strong order book, so we've delivered some good results for last year, but we've also got a good order book of £510 million, which gives us lots of work ahead of us and good visibility of the next financial year as well. In the I mentioned, we're continuing to build value there. Our share of profit from that joint venture, it's a 50-50 joint venture, our share of profit uh, at 1.3 million reflects a record EBITDA of 11 million pounds from the joint venture business and record output of 108,000 tonnes uh, as well of structural steel. And that compares uh, well with our UK uh, volume output of about 115,000 tonnes in a year. So India is a it is growing strongly and the volumes are, are strong there. Um, all of that gives us underlying basic EPS up 18% to 8.5 pence per share and the total dividend will be up 10% to 3.4 pence per share. So those are the headlines. I'll now hand over to Adam for a little bit more detail on the financials and I'll come back and go through the rest, the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Alan, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll just take you through a bit more detail on the profit and loss account. Um, you can see that uh, the results this year were, were excellent. Um, we recorded record revenues, and as Alan said, our profits were ahead of expectations. Um, it's also the first time since 2009 since the group has recorded profits of more than £30 million, which is an important milestone for us. Revenue for the year was £492 million, and that was an increase of 22% of the previous year, reflecting an increase in production activity and steel, price, steel prices, and also an output for the year of 115,000 tonnes, including subcontracted work. 
Underlying operating profit was £33.1 million, up 23% over the previous year. And the increase in profit, as Alan said, reflects strong operational delivery and a number of ongoing projects, but also highlights our ability to offset ongoing inflationary cost increases through a combination of operating efficiencies, higher selling prices and contractual protection, as steel is a pass-through cost for the group. The operating profit or operating margin of 6.7% is unchanged from the previous year, and this continues to reflect the impact of the higher steel prices that are passed on to clients at zero margin. So in reality, our margin is slightly ticked up because of the impact of the higher steel prices. The share of profit from JVs and Associates of 1.9 million, that includes 1.3 million from JSSL, which is our Indian joint venture, and 0.6 million from CMF, uh, our cold drill steel businesses, which forms part of our modular solutions division. The increased profits in India reflect revenue growth, improved margins, and also a record EBITDA for the business of £11 million. So overall, underlying PBT of £32.5 million is up 20% in the previous year, and the dividend of 3.4p per share, which includes the proposed final dividend of 2.1p, is up 10%. And that's allowed us to retain a healthy dividend cover of between 2.1 or 2.4 and 2.5 times. Looking ahead to next financial year, our expectations remain unchanged, and this takes into account our high quality order book, good earnings visibility, and encouraging prospects, but also retaining an element of caution, giving a softer UK distribution market and some delays in client decision making, which Alan will pick up later on. Returning over to India, a bit more detail of the joint venture. And as Alan said, this is a non-consolidated company, and so we don't consolidate these numbers, but we account for 50% of its share of profits. Um, the business has continued to recover well post-pandemic and has reported a profit after tax of, of 2.6 million, of which our share was 1.3 million pounds. This reflects revenue of 138 million pounds, which represents an increase of nearly 40% over the previous year, reflecting an increase in output to 108,000 tonnes from 58,000 tonnes in the previous year, again including subcontracted work. This is a record for the business and means that our Indian joint ventures output for the year was almost equivalent to that of our entire UK and Europe operations. The improved result for India also reflects operating margins of 6.3% compared to 5.2% of the previous year due to an improved work mix and also strong operational delivery. Unfortunately, some of JSSL's operating profit of £8.7 million has been offset by finance costs of £5.1 million, which are over 50% higher than the previous year. This is unusual, this is unusual for the business uh, and reflects a higher level of borrowing due to inflation on working capital an increased letter of credit costs on steel purchases, which have more than doubled over recent years. And we would expect these finance costs to reduce over in future periods. Turning to the balance sheet, um, the balance sheet shows an increase uh, in net assets, 218 million pounds from 204 million pounds in 2022, reflecting the profit for the year, a decrease in the pension liability offset by normal dividend payments. The pension liability is relatively small. It's decreased again by £1.5 million to £12.9 million since March 2022, reflecting another increase in the discount rate and also the ongoing deficit contributions made during the year. Uh, towards the end of the financial year, March 2023, we also increased our revolving credit facility from £50 million to £60 million as part of the acquisition of Vertman, which Alan will touch on later in the presentation, and this provides us with enhanced liquidity and extra long-term financing for our growth strategy. On to cash flow, which is a real strength for the group. Um, just as a bit of an overview, uh, we normally our normal working capital uh, percentage of sales range is four to six percent, and this reflects the fact that uh, we only buy steel and specifically for contract purchases, and we don't we do not uh, carry high levels of steel stock. We also credit insure our receivables book to mitigate risk. Um, so overall, you can see our balance sheet and cash position remains healthy. We had a year of strong cash generation and our operating cash conversion, which shows the percentage of our operating combined, operating profit that we convert into cash was 145%. And that increased, it resulted in increased year end net funds, excluding the IFRS 16 liabilities of 2.7 million pounds. And this represented gross cash of 12 million pounds offset by outstanding acquisition loans of 9 million pounds. 
Our overall improved cash position reflects an operating cash inflow of £38 million uh, an inflow from working capital of £40 million, which largely represents an unwinding of a high working capital position coming into the year and also some advanced payments from customers. Year-end working capital was around 5% of sales within the 4 to 6% range that I talked about previously. This has been offset by some deferred and contingent consideration payments of £8.5 million relating to an acquisition in 2021. Um, and we have also spent money on capex of 6.2, which I'll come back to you, um, dividends of £9 million or £9.9 million and tax and interest of £6 million. And finally, for me, in terms of investment, we've invested 6.3 million capex in 2023, which includes site improvements and new production machinery of 4.6 billion pounds, mainly to improve operations at Dalton, our main site, Lost Stock, and Ballin Mallard. Purchase of more construction site equipment of 0.9 million pounds to reduce our reliance on leased equipment from third parties, and office improvements of 0.8 million pounds, including the recent relocation of our head office from Dalton to Thirsk. As Alan said, we've invested more than £60 million in CapEx over the past 10 years, making the business more resilient and operationally efficient. And I will now hand back to Alan for the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I've now got um, four slides covering strategy and some overall group themes before we take a deeper dive into the UK and Europe elements of the business, and then also our Indian joint venture. So um, we've been following the same strategic priorities for the last few years, and, and these, these remain unchanged. First and foremost is to drive drive growth. Uh, most recently, we've, been, we've improved our market position in Europe with an acquisition of Vertman Steel Construction, um, and, 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 and we've aligned the business to with, with market with strong growth potential, and we'll say more about that uh, shortly. Um, our nuclear infrastructure business uh, has secured important frameworks in the, the nuclear sector, which we will... Uh, come back to, and we've all, we're also developing a, a modular solutions business, which is smaller than the core structural steel business, but we believe has good growth and um, potential. I mentioned at the outset the, the strong operational platform. We continue to drive operational efficiency across all areas of the business, and the big event during the year was the launch of Project Horizon, our digital transformation project, uh, which I'll come back to as well. Um, India has been a core part of the business of the strategy for several years. Um, India has uh, largely been a, a concrete construction market for, for many years. It's now beginning to convert to steel and is growing strongly, and there's very significant growth uh, growth ahead there. And finally, on ESG, um, it really encompasses all parts of the business. We were uh, um, spent a lot, a lot of time on this before it became fashionable more recently in areas like health and safety, reducing our emissions. We were doing that uh, five, six, seven years ago uh, and is a strong part of what we what we do and is core to our strategy going forward. So just to say a bit about uh, Project um, Horizon, um, we launched this during the year. Uh, the, 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 the end objective is to digitize and automate as much of the business as we possibly possibly can, uh, specifically in areas of estimating, design, production, contract delivery processes, all core parts of the business um, for us. Um, it's a long-term project, but we've we've, um, we, we've developed more than 100 individual short, medium and long-term projects as part of this roadmap, uh, and we now have a full-time team of 14 people working on this, uh, on this programme. We believe it's quite exciting. It's a already self-financing, it will transform the business in the medium to long term and we believe we will start to see net service and efficiency benefits over the next two to three years. As I said, um, on ESG we've been um, working on this for, for many years and I'm not going to go through all the individual points here but it gives you a flavour for the, the level of external validation that we're getting for our efforts, whether it's on emissions reduction or the 5% club, which is all about earning and learning, investing in training or training of employees, whether it's in social value for contract tenders or supporting local communities. There's lots going on in every, every part of the business and it's really central to our um, our, our thinking and um, uh, we'll, we'll be driving that uh, very much going forward. What's um, particularly Interesting for us, though, is when we join the, uh, the ESG themes, 
with our top strategic objective of, of, of growth, we get into this area of green investment and what we call the the the, the green transition of the of the economy. Uh, there's five five examples here: more nuclear power, uh, battery plants for electric car batteries, renewable uh, wind turbine plants, and so on. Decarbonate decarbonization of the transport network, that's rail electrification, and so on, along with uh, the move towards low carbon buildings. All of these um, are areas which involve a lot of capital investment, which we are well pre uh, well prepared to to supply and to support. And we believe these will generate strong themes of demand for the business in the coming the, the, the coming years. In addition to this, you've got carbon capture, uh, electricity storage, um, and things like the, the upgrade and development of, of the electricity grid. Again, all, all areas which we believe will be able to support as well. So that whole green transition of the economy, we think represents a strong theme for the business going, going forward. So if we now take a deeper dive into the UK and Europe, um, we reorganised the business at the beginning of the financial year just, just finished into three market focused divisions, commercial and industrial, nuclear and infrastructure and modular solutions. Um, now, commercial industrial five years ago would have been at the core of the business, but with recent acquisitions, we've developed the nuclear infrastructure division and also the, the modular solutions um, division. They each have different dynamics, the different market dynamics, each of their own management teams, driving improved customer service, efficiency and strategy. And it's all underpinned by centralised group manufacturing, uh, which optimises the production footprint that we have across uh, seven facilities uh, and also allows us to optimise production efficiency initiatives across the whole group uh, as, as well. Uh, looking externally to general market conditions at the moment, um, we are generally positive based on our order book and the pipeline that we're seeing and also the, the trends in the market. But equally, we are sensitive to some of the short term uh, economic pressures, which uh, are, are evident in the, the news in the news every day. Uh, we're seeing a bit of softness in the distribution uh, sector just now. We believe that's short term softness because there's still a strong pipeline there. And we're seeing one or two delays in client uh, decision making, I guess, while waiting for the station, inflation to stabilise and, and such like. But to, generally speaking, we are uh, quite positive about our, our outlook. We are seeing inflation stabilise compared to 12, 18 months ago, where we had quite strong steel inflation and energy price inflation. So we're seeing a, a more stable backdrop already. Uh, and we're seeing continued stable steel supply, which is uh, very important um, for us. This it just puts our current order book in a bit of context, showing the uh, the total level historically, also how much of that total of 510 is for delivery within the next 12 months. And you can see it gives us good short term visibility and you can see the divisional split uh, as well on the left hand side of the slide. The, the next slide um, presents that slightly differently and shows how that we have developed the business and broadened the business over the past the past five years. Uh, five years ago, um, we were um, more susceptible to one or two sectors dominating the, the order book. Uh, but now with the acquisitions and other efforts we've made, we've got a much broader um, order book across several sectors, which gives us both resilience and opportunities for growth uh, when uh, demand is particularly strong in uh, one area or another. We have the capacity to support that, support that growth. So looking at the commercial and industrial uh, order book makeup in a little bit more detail, that is particularly strong at the moment in the industri industrial and distribution sector. And that's more industrial than distribution, as per my earlier comments on the softening distribution. Industrial for us is the start of some of the, the green energy transition projects, car battery plants and wind turbine plants and so on. And we see that sector remaining stable for the foreseeable, foreseeable future. Stadium and leisure. We are well advanced with the, the Everton, New Everton Stadium. We're well advanced with the Co-op Live Arena in Manchester. And we're building some uh, quite large film studios in the south, southeast of England as well. And we see demand there remaining fairly steady for the foreseeable future as well. Uh, commercial offices is a little bit lower, uh, but we see a, a good pipeline, good pipeline there. We're tendering for several jobs uh, in London and elsewhere uh, just now. Uh, and we see that pipeline building. Uh, 
data centers, uh, 5% is a lower than it's been for us in the past, but again, demand for these is fairly consistent and they see a strong pipeline of future work there, um, uh, there, there also. So I think that the, that's the order book makeup. And I think that the, we're seeing a fairly, fairly good uh, medium term demand characteristics, which will drive the order book in this, in, in this division further in the coming, uh, the coming years ahead. If we move on to the nuclear infrastructure uh, division, uh, a very positive development for us during the year was securing a position as a key delivery partner on Sellafield's uh, long-term PPP programme. That should run for the next 16 to 17 years and gives us a position um, a position on uh, most of the steel work they'll be doing as part of the decommissioning uh, programme at, at Sellafield. We also have some shorter term framework agreements uh, for ancillary steelwork at Hinkley. And the importance of these framework agreements is it gives us sight of demand, which sits outside the order book. So the order book here is only part of the overall picture, but we see um, uh, strong demand from these framework agreements as well. Also in here um, is transport infrastructure. We're now doing quite a lot of HS2 work um, and bridges uh, are, are now being done after many years of waiting, but that, that we're now uh, well on with that, and there's some more in the pipeline there, there's some stations in the pipeline, and we're also doing work for Network Rail and Highways England on uh, road and uh, rail upgrading expansion as well. So we see this as being a, a good strong division with good long-term demand characteristics. The acquisition of Virtman we completed just after the, the year end. Uh, we're very pleased with it, it's our first mainland Europe um, acquisition um, and it's a really really good strong uh, business It's well managed it's got a good strong position in the domestic Dutch market it's uh, well invested it's operationally efficient um, and it, it also gives us a kind of a good collaboration with the other part of Wurtman which is our uh, one of the world leading ma manufacturers of steel fabrication equipment so, that, so that, 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 that both parts were, were, were we're family owned, we've bought the, the steel construction business, they're retaining the other bits, so we have an ongoing collaboration uh, agreement there. And what this um, business gives us is growth opportunities uh, in, in three areas. Uh, one is the steel construction business, which is very similar to our coexisting uh, business that we, we had already in the UK. There is also a, a smaller uh, turnkey design and build business where clients like the suppliers of the steel work to supply cladding and roofing and some of the groundworks as well. That involves a skill set that we didn't previously have and is more important for mainland Europe. So we now have that, which we think we can grow and develop. And finally, they have a, a small business which fabricates steel transformers for the, for the Dutch electricity grid. And that's about to undergo a significant expansion and development as well to support the green the green economy. So three different sectors. Uh, elements of the business there, all with um, opportunities for growth and development. And when we combine that with our existing position in Europe, we've had a, a sales and project delivery office in Europe for the last, the last six years, or building its own pipeline of work. So if we combine that with the development of that acquisition, it gives us a very strong platform to sort of grow and develop further, uh, both organically and through possible acquisition, further acquisition, in mainland Europe. So that's a, that's a very good and important development for the, for the group. The final division in UK and Europe is Severfield Modular Solutions, which uh, uh, we broke out for the first time in the, in the last year and, we'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll be reporting on separately um, in future. Uh, three separate elements to it. One is the Sever Store product range, which um, makes steel containers or housings for critical electric electrical equipment for remote and external environments, um, uh, such as, and in, 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 in we do a lot for the electrification of the rail network, we do a lot for um, um, nuclear power stations, data centers, and so on. Uh, the second element of the module is, is supply chain, which involves the supplying of steel frames for the growing modular construction um, market, either commercial, construction or residential construction, a lot of these modular buildings require steel frames, uh, either cold rolled steel or hot rolled steel or a hybrid of, 
a hybrid of both. And with our CMF joint venture, we are very well placed to develop our position in that supply chain. And thirdly, bulk handling solutions, we have a product called Rotoflow, which is a niche product. It's a, a silo discharge um, a silo discharge product, um, which uh, in the past, before we took it on, um, was focused mainly for Indian paint manufacturers and UK water treatment manufacturers. What we are now doing with that is broadening market sectors and geographical exposure. And uh, we think there's good opportunities there. So it's all quite new and quite small, but the, 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 these are different product ranges to the, the core structural steel business. And we are pretty pretty positive that the growth, the growth prospects for all of these in the years ahead. Um, so if we turn now to our Indian joint venture, just to recap again, it's a 50-50 joint venture. We've It's been in place for several years. The original objective was to try and help convert the Indian construction market from concrete to steel. Uh, that's beginning to happen. We, we started to see real progress in 2017, 18 and 19. And then it's, it's been a bit more difficult, as Adam said, during the past couple of years with the impact of the pandemic. But we're now returning to pre-pandemic growth rates in India, as you can see in the in the results. And for us, what's quite interesting here is the EBIT that of 11 million pounds, because when we look at valuations of comparable businesses in the infrastructure space in India, uh, market multiples uh, tend to be nine times or more. So we believe that what we've built in India already has quite significant value, but we also believe it's just the, it's just the start. Um, we have a strategy and business plan to increase volumes there from about 108,000 tonnes to somewhere between 250 and 300,000 tonnes over the next few years. And we've revalidated that in recent uh, recent months and believe that that objective is very much achievable and, and that would help move our, move the PBT for the business up to 20 million pounds plus and move that EBITDA number up to around 30 million and, 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 and beyond. So you can see why we believe there's quite significant opportunity for growth and value creation there and you know all underpinned by this broad growth and use of steel and construction for 5 million tonnes in the current year to between 16 and 18 million tonnes in 2028. Uh, and we're, we're quite close to buying some additional land for a new plant in India. So all very exciting uh, uh, with strong prospects ahead. Um, the order book is, um, it is stable, but as I was saying before with some of the other divisions in the UK and Europe, uh, what's more important for us is the, is the pipeline and the medium term to long term demand characteristics. And if we move on to this slide um you can see that we've refreshed this after following recent work you can look at all these different steel construction sectors all of which we can supply uh, and all of which are presenting very very good and exciting opportunities for growth in the coming um in the coming in the coming years so I, I, I believe our challenge would, would be to make sure that we choose those sectors and those clients where uh, our whole value proposition is recognised to really maximise the profit growth that will accompany the volume growth uh, over the next four, five, six uh, years and, the, and, and beyond. So uh, really lots to look forward to in India now that we're beyond the impact of the, of, of the pandemic. So in summary, I think we've had a Another very good year financially, with revenue and profits up 20%, uh, final dividend um, up again, uh, and strong cash generation supporting uh, the strong cash generation model in, 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 in dynamics of the, the business, as Adam, as Adam outlined. We've launched Project Horizon, which continues our drive for internal efficiency and digitization, automation and transformation. Uh, and we've also continued our geographic expansion with the acquisition of Zurtman. Uh, after the, the year end. So all of that, uh, we believe, um, gives us a strong outlook. The strategy is, is unchanged. The order book gives us good short-term um, visibility. Many of the sectors we're in have a good medium to long-term outlook. There's a good pipeline of short-term short opportunities in the UK, as we've talked about. Uh, we've reaffirmed in recent months the kind of a, the strategy and plan for 
for India, uh, and we expect the current year results to be in line with in line with expectations. So overall, it's been another strong year for the group, uh, with more with more to come. That marks the end of the formal uh, presentation. I'm going to hand back briefly to uh, our hosts, and then we'll work through some of the questions that have been submitted. Perfect. Alan, Adam, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments through those questions that have been submitted today, I'd like to remind you that the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Alan, Adam, as you can see, received an, a number of questions throughout today's presentation. If I could ask you to read out those questions and give response to where it's appropriate to do so, I'll pick up from you at the end. Um, okay, I'll let Adam take the first one and I'll take the second one. <clears throat> I have a question here from Alex C, which says, uh, with a strong order book, what visibility do you have 24, 2024 revenue and profit number? Um, with the order book, you can see in one of the slides Alan presented, the amount for delivery in the next 12 months was £374 million, and that was from June onwards. And what that translates into is revenue and profit coverage of around 70, 75%. For 2024. And the second question is asking, can we break down the concentration of the order book and revenue by by client, uh, please? Um, and I think what I would do is refer back to the commercial, industrial and nuclear infrastructure slice, which breaks it down by, by sector, as I went through. We tend not to break down by client because clients can... Um, vary depending on contract structure uh, and project wins and so on. But we, we generally serve, uh, work with most, pretty much all the main contractors in the UK. And we also sometimes deal with clients directly. So I think that the, the, the order book breakdown we have in, in the commercial, industrial and nuclear infrastructure gives the best visibility of that sectoral um, uh, breakdown. Um, the next question is asking about how we manage inflationary pressures and pricing new business and managing existing contracts. Um, the, when we take on a, a new contract or when we secure a new contract, uh, we make sure that all the costs we have are fixed for the duration of that, either material costs that are fixed for duration or overheads. And if it, if for a longer term contract, we either have a little allowance for inflation or inflationary um, uh, terms in the in the contract, but we don't take particularly steel price risk in individual contracts. How we're we'll managing all of that is that he, we've been updating our costs pretty regularly as, 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 as they move along. It was really quite hard work, as you can imagine, 12, 18 months ago when both steel and energy were increasing quite significantly. We had to quite regular, frequent conversations with clients, even during tender processes. Um, but for us, once we've, uh, once we've awarded the contract, the costs are fixed and that gives clients certainty. It gives us the control uh, and allows us to deliver without worrying about inflation. So that's how we go about uh, that. And I say what's helpful now, as I mentioned earlier on, is that the rel relatively speaking, the inflationary environment today is a lot better than it was 12, 18 months ago, albeit it's still high and we hope it comes down uh, further over the, over the coming months. Um, the next question is the company disappointed by its valuation, which doesn't really recognise current levels of, of growth. Um, I, I think it's interesting. I think that the we would always like the, the share price to be um, to be higher, um, uh, but but I think in general um, there's factors impacting the whole of the um, the UK. Stock market. A lot of these are quite topical in the press quite often about pension fund investments and so on, and also on the construction sector in recent years uh, has been derated a little bit, and we've tended to follow that. So I think that uh, when you look at what, what we've done with the business, the risk profile, and so on, uh, uh, we'd always like it to be higher, uh, but we understand that the factors which are uh, have impacted that at, at, at the moment. Uh, and there's things like with our control, obviously there, so that's probably all, all I uh, need to say on that. Um, the next question, um, 
is about India and the cumulative capital that we have deployed in the region and plans for further uh, land acquisition. Um, so I think, I think, as we said before, there are plans for further land acquisition, which we're close to finalising the health expansion. Uh, Adam will just summarise the capital investment. Yeah, we've, we, we've invested twenty-four million pounds to to date in India, and for the next expansion, we'd expect another two to three million pounds to go in to help fund that. But investment beyond that will come from within the the, the joint venture. So, and I think that to uh, come back to the earlier comments um, and the growth potential over the next few years, we would see a lot of further investment by the business to get volumes up to 250, 300,000 tonnes and possibly, possibly beyond. But you can see also with, with the value we believe that will create, that, 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 that will create value for the, um, the, the UK business and eventually um, cash uh, it returns. Um, the next question um, is about a recent strike and impact on future staff costs. Uh, yeah, the strike is resolved, uh, thankfully, and we um, we, man we, we managed to sort of a, um, cont contain staff costs to round about uh, the current levels of inflation uh, across the whole business, uh, and, and we're very happy for both the, uh, those employees that were striking and the business with the, with the agreement that we reached. So uh, I think managing costs in an a high inflation environment is always difficult, so I'm glad we've resolved that and we can move on and keep uh, remaining competitive. Um, the next question uh, is around the competitive landscape and now with an expanded footprint in Europe, which should be the sustainable margin potential of the group relative to the six, circa 6.5% six currently. Um, I think as we, as we expand geographically, um, the competitive landscape evolves. I think the UK uh, competitive landscape has been reasonably stable over the over the last few years. I think we've got, we've got a good range of competitors and uh, who compete strongly in uh, different sectors, but we very few uh, competitors cover all the sectors that we're in. Um, but we, we, we've got good competition in the UK, but it's generally stable. I think as we do more in Europe, um, we'll learn more about that landscape. Um, um, and there's a bit more change, it varies, it varies by country, but we think with the scale of the projects we see in the pipeline there, uh, some of the strengths we have in the UK are starting to be valued by uh, clients uh, for certainly bigger projects, more complex projects in mainland Europe, but it's still relatively early days, uh, but we're quite positive about the, the competitive advantages that we bring to clients in mainland, in mainland Europe. In terms of margins, um, the, to some extent, depends on where steel prices are. I think if steel prices today were at the levels they were at two years ago, our margins would be up at 8% plus, which is uh, within our target range. Uh, so we're not unhappy with the 6.5, 6.7 we're at just now. Um, and we're still trying to improve all of that, but it will, the actual number will depend on uh, the impact of steel prices, which are a pass through for us, as I mentioned earlier on. Steel prices, we don't take steel price risk and we pass these through as part of our contract prices. Um, I think I've said, uh, I've mentioned there's another question of the strike and how we avoid a repetition. I think I've said a lot about that. And I think we, we, we need to keep engaging constructively um, with the, the element of the workforce that uh, it was on strike. And just to put it in context, it was one one area of the workforce with just over 200 employees out of a total workforce of 1900 now. So um, that just with a bit of context on there and we will continue to sort of a, uh, work towards more constructive engagement with the whole, the whole workforce. Um, uh, there's a question on interest rates uh, and is any debt exposed to continue increasing interest rates? That's one for Adam, I think. Yeah, um, we, um, uh, the current, the current revolving credit facility is based on floating rates. Um, so to answer the question directly, we would be exposed to continued increase in the increase rates. But the more important point is that our debt is very low. So at year end, when I talked about net funds of £3 million, only £9 million of that 
um, related to loans. As I say, there was twelve million pounds of cash. Um, with the Verbal acquisition, we have borrowed more money, another nineteen million pounds. Um, but to give uh, some indication of how relatively small this is to the company, a one percent increase in interest rates would only make around two hundred thousand pounds um, profit impact. So it's not something we're particularly concerned about. And the final question we have at the moment is how much are the pension deficit contributions and when is the next uh, valuation? The contributions at the moment are two and a half million pounds a year. Uh, the next final valuation uh, is as at the 31st of March 2023, so it's in progress at the moment. Um, but our expectation without prejudging anything is that the deficit, the actuarial deficit will reduce from the last valuation, um, and that will possibly mean uh, continuing contribution at the current level, but, but, but perhaps a shorter recovery period. But that gets into prejudging the outcome of it. But the, the next valuation is March, is at March 23, uh, and we would expect it to be lower than the, the, what, the last one three years ago. Alan, Adam, thank you very much for that. I think you've actually addressed every question from the investors. And of course, the company will review all questions submitted today and will publish those responses on the Investor Meet Company platform. But just before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to you both, Alan, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I'd just like to thank um, everyone for their, um, their time and attention in uh, attending today. As I say, it's, it's, new, it's new for us and I hope you found it useful. And um, uh, we would expect to be doing more of these in the future to try and access a wider um, range of investors than we do during our normal institutional roadshow. So thank you for your attention. We believe we've got a good story, uh, which we've outlined and lots to look forward to, and we look forward to uh, updating you uh, next time around. Thank you very much. Alan, Adam, thanks once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session, as you know, be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Severfield PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.